This is the last part of our Intro Bacteriaceae lecture. And again, we're going to talk about several different genera in this lecture, and we're going to start off with Proteus, Morganella, and Providencia. In general, these organisms are normal intestinal flora. They can be opportunistic pathogens. They are able to deaminate phenylalanine by producing phenylalanine deaminase, and there is a biochemical test that can be done to test this. And these are non-lactose fermenters, unlike some of our other organisms we've talked about, like Klebsiella and Escherichia coli, which are lactose fermenters. There are four different species of the genus Proteus. They are Proteus mirabilis, Proteus vulgaris, Proteus penery, and Proteus mixifacians. And you can see a nice electron micrograph of Proteus with the long flagella. So of course you know, you see this picture with the long flagella all around, that Proteus is modal. So Proteus mirabilis and Proteus vulgaris are the most common disease-causing species of the genus Proteus. They've been isolated from urines, wounds, ear, blood specimens, and they're responsible for 3% of all nosocomial or hospital-acquired infections in the United States. They can cause acute glomerulonephritis in patients with urinary tract defects or patients that are catheterized. And the a key feature of Proteus is that when they are inoculated onto blood agar, they produce swarming. So they will take over and swarm over the entire blood agar. So Proteus can actually be um, a pain in the clinical laboratory because they can be normal flora in the intestinal tract and so they they are common commonly found in the environment so you can easily get a contaminant of Proteus that will take over your plates and then it's very difficult for you if you have a pathogen also on that plate that you're trying to isolate. It's very difficult because the Proteus takes over the whole plate. Um, it has been described as having a burnt chocolate odor but we don't smell um, organisms growing on plates, so we will never know what smell this organism has because we're not going to sniff our plates. It produces hydrogen sulfide, so that should go on your chart if you're making ch a chart, just like Salmonella produces hydrogen sulfide, and it is urease positive. Proteus mirabilis and Proteus vulgaris are the two most common um, species of Proteus, and they can be differentiated based on their indole and ornithine decarboxylase test reactions. So Proteus vulgaris is indole positive and ornithine negative. It is also sucrose positive. So we're going to talk about triple sugar iron agar in more detail. We have already discussed it in, in our week one lecture, and we are going to talk about it in our enteric diagnosis lecture, where we're going to talk about all of these different types of tests. But in general, in our triple sugar iron agar, we have our agar slant. And if you remember, this agar slant will allow you to tell a glucose fermenter. So all Enterobacteriaceae ferment glucose. So the bottom or the butt of the tube will always be yellow or acid. If the slant is also yellow or acid, that means it's either a lactose and or sucrose fermenter as well. So an Enterobacteriaceae member that ferments either lactose or sucrose is going to be acid over acid or yellow over yellow on triple sugar iron agar because all Enterobacteriaceae members ferment glucose, which the bottom of the, the tube represents the glucose. So again, we'll talk about that in much more detail later. 
Here is Proteus vulgaris, and this isn't even a blood agar. This is just a, a general nutrient agar, and you can see it swarming. Now, it doesn't swarm as well on non-blood-based media, so on blood agar, it takes over the entire plate. But you can see that cloudy area going across half of the plate. Here it is on blood agar. So in this example, the very center of this blood agar plate were touched with Proteus mirabilis. And those concentric rings are the organism swarming out from the inoculum site in the center of the plate out towards the edge of the plate. So that's kind of a fun thing you can do with Proteus mirabilis. And if we were, we had a laboratory that we were doing along with this course, we would do this exercise so you can see how quickly Proteus mirabilis can take over an entire blood agar plate. Morganella is another genus in the Enterobacteriaceae family, and the only species is Morganii. It has been documented, documented to cause urinary tract infections, and it has also been isolated from other body sites, but it is not a common cause of infection. Providencia has several species, Alcalifacians, Stewardii, Redgiri, Rusticanii, um, so there, there are numerous species in Providencia. And the general features are that Providencia retgiri is the documented pathogen of the urinary tract, and Stewardii is a common nosocomial infection in burn patients. Providencia is highly resistant to antimicrobial agents, which is a problem in burn patients. Burn patients, you know, they, they don't have that first line of defense, their skin, so they're highly, highly susceptible to infection. And then if they get an organism um, like Providencia that's highly resistant to antimicrobials, that can be an infection that is very difficult, if not impossible, to treat. Another genus in the Enterobacteriaceae family is Citrobacter. And there are many, many species of Citrobacter. Citrobacter frundii, diversus, farmeri. Um, so we're not going to discuss all of these species. In general, the citro Citrobacter organisms ferment lactose, and they are urease positive, although they will hydrolyze urea very slowly. They will grow on Simmons citrate agar, and we will talk about citrate agar. They are positive for methyl red, and Citrobacter frundii has been isolated from stool specimens from patients with diarrhea. It has also been associated with nosocomial infections that have caused urinary tract infections, pneumonia, and abscesses. It's been associated with endocarditis in injection drug users, and Citrobacter frundii produces hydrogen sulfide. Another genus is Hafnia, and Hafnia alvei is the only species, and there are two biotypes. It's been isolated from numerous human specimens as well as the environment. It is not a large cause of disease, and it has a delayed positive citrate reaction. Another genus is Edwardsiella. And there are three species of Edwardsiella, Edwardsiella tarda, Edwardsiella hoshini, and Edwardsiella ictiluri. Edwardsiella tarda, though, is the only human pathogen, so it's the only one we care about in this course. It is negative for urease, it grows on Simmons citrate, and it is positive for lysine decarboxylase, hydrogen sulfide, and indole. And um, Clivera, it's one of those other gen uh, genera in the Enterobacteriaceae family. 
it's not a again it doesn't it's not a common disease causing organism all of the organisms in the Enterobacteriaceae family can cause disease if they get the opportunity so many are opportunistic organisms but they're not common disease causing organisms so we don't focus on the ones that you won't commonly see in a clinical laboratory now on the left hand side is a blood agar plate and you can see a blue violet pigment of the Clivera species and it does resemble the morphology of E. coli on McConkie agar. Now on the uh, figure B this is the Clivera growing on McConkie agar and it fer ferments lactose it has a nice bright pink colony morphology. Now here is a flow chart and a lot of the Enterobacteriaceae members can be differentiated based on their reaction on triple sugar iron agar. So again, all of the Enterobacteriaceae members ferment glucose. So the bottom or the, the um, underneath, because triple sugar iron agar is always K over K, K over A, A over A. The bottom A will always be acid or yellow if it's an Enterobacteriaceae member because they all ferment glucose. Those that ferment lactose or sucrose will also be A on the top or the slant. So those that are A over A are glucose and lactose or sucrose fermenters. Those that are K over A ferment glucose but don't ferment lactose or sucrose. So triple sugar iron agar is critical with your Enterobacteriaceae members. So for K over A in other words, glucose fermentation, but not lactose or sucrose, with hydrogen sulfide production, you have your Proteus mirabilis, your Salmonella, your Citrobacter frondii, and your Edwardsiella tarda. Now you need to do other tests then to differentiate these four organisms. So you can do phenylalanine deaminase, and if it's positive, you would have Proteus mirabilis. If it's negative, you need to do more tests. So you can do a lysine decarboxylase test. If it's negative, it would be either Citrobacter frondii or Salmonella paratyphi A. If it's positive, it's either other Salmonella species or Edwardsiella tarda, and then you need to do an indole to differentiate those two. If it's A over A, in other words, it's a glucose fermenter, as well as a lactose and or sucrose fermenter, and produces hydrogen sulfide, it's either Proteus vulgaris, Citrobacter frondii, um, and Salmonella Arizona, Arizona. That's an old nomenclature. So you would have to do phenylalanine deaminase to differentiate those. If it is K over A, in other words, a glucose fermenter without lactose or sucrose fermentation and does not produce hydrogen sulfide, it's a whole list of potential organisms and you need to continue doing other tests to differentiate, such as phenylalanine deaminase, citrate, and motility. And if it's A over A, again, a glucose plus a lactose and or sucrose without H2S production, it's four of your more common organisms, your E. coli, your Klebsiella, your Enterobacter, and your Serratia. You would need to do your IMVIC, Indole, Methyl Red, Vogue's Proskauer, and Citrate tests. You need to know the IMVIC reaction of those four organisms. So E. coli's IMVIC is always positive, positive, negative, negative. Embed that in your memory. Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and Serratia are negative, negative, positive, positive embed that in your memory as well.
You'd want to look at motility. Out of those organisms, Klebsiella is non-modal. The others are, are positive, and then you would want to do DNA tests to then differentiate further. Now, K over K on TSIA would be a non-glucose fermenter, non-lactose, non-sucrose. So these are non-fermenting organisms. And we are going to talk about the non-fermenting gram-negative rods in our next lecture. So this lecture, we focus on Enterobacteriaceae, which are all glucose fermenters. Here's another more simplistic um, flow chart where you have your gram-negative rods. Your oxidase test is one of the first tests you can do to differentiate some of your organisms. Now, all of your Enterobacteriaceae members are going to be oxidase negative. So once you know it's oxidase negative, you'd be thinking more of an Enterobacteriaceae member, and then you'd want to look at your McConkie agar. If it turns bright pink or red on McConkie agar, it would mean it's a lactose fermenter. So you can narrow down your organisms that way. So if it's a lactose fermenter and it's indole positive and it's an oxidase negative gram negative rod, it's likely to be Escherichia coli. If it is a gram negative rod, oxidase negative, lactose fermenter that's indole negative, you'd then want to do a urease test. If it's positive, it would be likely Klebsiella. If it's negative, it would likely be Enterobacter. So this is a much more simplistic flow chart. There is another flow chart in your lecture notes that I made that you can also use to study from. You can make your own flow chart. Just double check and make sure all your re reactions are correct. And you need to really memorize and study these flow charts. You should have a nice flow chart, not one quite as simplistic as this. You should have a, a much more in-depth flow chart completely memorized for the second exam, for your final exam. It should be embedded in your memory when you go to your clinical rotations. You're going to need it memorized for your board of certification exams. So the, um, some of these flow charts are really critical. And again, here's another um, much more simplistic flow chart. So this is going to be the end of the Enterobacteriaceae lecture. There are a lot of organisms. There are a lot of reactions. We're going to talk about the reactions in much more detail in the next lecture, so they will all make sense. They would make a lot more sense if we also were doing them in the laboratory. I'm going to show a lot of pictures of different reactions so you can really see them. And so when you get to the clinical labs, you'll already know what what it looks like and what it means to be pink or to be yellow in a certain test reaction.